ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome to the greatest NZ live political podcast in the world, The Working Group, hosted by beloved left-wing broadcaster Comrade Bomber Bradbury, with the best political panel in New Zealand media, reviewing the week, setting the agenda, avoiding defamation. The Working Group is brought to you by Gravity Credit Management. When the weight of capitalism is becoming the event horizon of an imploding black hole, call 0800 Gravity and our team will get blood out of a stone. That's 0800 Gravity. This is The Working Group. Kia ora, ate ora. I'm your host, the editor of the Daily Blog, Martin Bradbury. Hashtag socialism, hashtag solidarity, hashtag Jacinda forever. QAnon anti-vaxxer incel lunatics to the right of me, insufferably humorless woke cancellation lynch mobs to the left of me, and here I am, dear listener, stuck in the radical middle with you. This is the Working Group, New Zealand's best and greatest weekly political podcast that isn't funded by New Zealand On Air. We're streaming from our purpose-built studio bunker adjacent to the Auckland Media Works studio on Facebook, YouTube, the Daily Blog, and next month we will be simulcasting on Freeview TV Channel 200 as the Working Group expands our podcast empire into terrestrial TV. Is Freeview ready for the Working Group? Legally, probably not. Our Twitter panel tonight is political commentator and media reviewer Tim Selwyn, who will be tweeting using the hashtag NZPOL and TWG. The podcast is available afterwards on Apple Podcasts, Rover, Spotify, iHeartRadio, YouTube, and Facebook. Joining me tonight for our free speech post posy <laughs> Parker special is the greatest political panel in New Zealand broadcasting history. His superpower is patriarchy, the libertarian liquidator, the Cthulhu of capitalism, the 17th most important northern Auckland rural fringe political cult columnist and stuff, Damien, all taxes, theft, grant. Kia ora, comrade. Welcome back to the show. Thank you, Bomber. One word to describe the week, please, sir. Oh, it's got to be patriarchy, as you were saying. I think the patriarchy has been well and truly re-established now for all time. We have we have narrowly defined the areas upon wom- which women are entitled to speak, and I think it's a huge day for the patriarchy. We're looking forward now to rolling back uh, things like property rights for women. Um, I think the vote is something we're going to consider. Huge win for the patriarchy. He's, very, ne- very he's never met a property right he doesn't like. Our <laughs> other panellist is political commentator and former National Party leader, press secretary, and staunch gender critical feminist, and a supporter of the speech at the day, Annie O'Brien. Kia ora, comrade. Welcome back to the show. Hello. One How word. Are you? To, one word to describe the week, please. I'm going to go with uh, shell shocked with the hyphen, so it's one word, um, because <laughs> having been in the middle of that pit of despair on Saturday, um, I think the last few days I have been a bit shell shocked. <laughs> And also our final panellist is the Deputy Leader of the ACT Party, uh, Book Van Velden. Uh, kia ora, Book. Kia ora, thanks for having me. Uh, welcome to the show. One word to describe the week, please. Oh, for me, it would have to be resilience or the lack thereof. You know, I think one thing that's been really lacking um, in all of this debate is what this tells young kids about their feelings um, and how they should approach problem solving. Uh, We're seeing more and more kids coming through um, into work who don't have basic levels of resilience because they have been so caught up with oppression of free speech and free critical thinking. Uh, that they're unable to have a challenge and a debate uh, and we don't have enough resilience in our society. Let's get into tonight's free speech post Posey Parker special. Issue one, free speech versus thugs veto. Who won over the weekend? Issue two, will culture wars dominate the election in 2023? Issue three, Marama Davidson versus white cis males. And issue four tonight, who wins and loses politically from a protest like this? Plus, we'll have a final word at the end of the show where each panellist gets a 90-second rant on any topic they want. Can we breach broadcasting standards this week? We're all looking at Damien. Let's kick things off tonight with issue one. Over the weekend, in Auckland, anger grifter Posey Parker faced a hostile crowd of trans activists. The activists quickly stormed the stage and attacked Parker while pelting her. I witnessed her being attacked, entering and leaving the protest, and we have footage on the daily blog of her being knocked to the ground. 
Woke trans allies celebrated a toxic trans troll getting cancelled. The rest of the country gasped in horror at the use of political violence and the thugs veto. Damien Grant, the woke, assaulted a woman, stormed the stage and literally chased her from the town square. Great day for free speech in New Zealand democracy. Thoughts? Well, I think New Zealand is having a bit of a free speech moment uh, and it's not going particularly well. Uh, this comes off the back of, you may remember, there was a drag queen uh, event in That's right. Avondale. Yep. Uh, and there were some people, they didn't go to the extent of what, what what happened in the rotunda in Albert Park, but there was an attempt to physically disrupt that because people were unhappy about what was happening and the Free Speech Union, to their credit, defended the right of the of that particular show to, to continue. Uh, we're also seeing the there's a, a crowd out there campaigning against co-governance uh, and there was a story and stuff today where the um, a venue in Havelock North um, pulled out because of what appears to be explicit threats um, made by uh, a local um, Hastings councillor. And then, of course, what we, we, we saw in the rotunda. And what is interesting looking at that, not just that it happened, right? These, these things happened in the scheme of things. It's not that important. But it's everything that goes around that is important. So the the whipping up of antagonism towards Ms. Parker leading up to that event, I think, was significant. And that included um, uh, Minister Wood. It included, frankly, even um, uh, Justice Gendel, who I thought had a, a very weak decision. Um, uh, we saw the failure of uh, the Human Rights Commissioner to come out until, I think, today. He he, he also a very, very weak defensive uh, free speech. Um, we saw um, the leader of the opposition, when prompted, conceded, oh, well, it was a mostly peaceful protest, but, you know, there were some people who overstepped the line. We need to defend free speech. I mean, this guy has no clue. Um, the, the, the Prime Minister... Again, a very weak defence of free speech. Mm. Um, it was only the the leader of the ACT Party, a book you'd be delighted, um, I'm sure, to have observed, was the only political leader mm -hmm. who came out bef without being asked. This is the other thing. Yeah. Luxon and Hipkins had to be asked. Seymour came out there right from the get-go and made the observation that those people who were claiming to be the victims were the ones that were the oppressors. I mean, this was Animal Farm uh, writ large. So, yeah, I think we're having a free speech moment in New Zealand, and I think we're failing. Follow-up question. The violent response by trans allies was the exact propaganda win that Posey Parker wanted. She has more social media followers than ever before, plus the clickbait donations they drive. Haven't the woke played directly into the hands of this anger grifter? I think you're going to have to run the clock out a year or two <clears throat> to, to, to see from that. Not necessarily. I, I think what there's two ways it could go. I mean, that people could look at that and say, right, we've had enough of this nonsense and we need to put this to an end. But I think the other way it could go is if people look at that and say, okay, that is now the parameter of free speech. Right. We've, we've, if, it is, if it is acceptable socially and possibly even legally to physically assault Ms. Parker and Ms. Parker um, and, and to do what was done without, not only without consequence, but with, but with social reward. Yeah. The people who yeah. did this thing are being fated at the moment. So um, it's Chanel Lal, the Herald columnist, and, and the woman, uh, the individual, sorry, who, who attacked with the tomato sauce. Um, I see there was a feature ad on in stuff today. Seem to be getting recognition and rewarded for their activity. So if that is a consequence for somebody who is prepared to, to take a physical stand, then the willingness of people to even uh, come online or, or say things, and in fact, Martin, you know, this this very podcast here today, I mean, uh, credit to you, um, but there was an enormous, the number of people who said yes, and then, oh my goodness, somebody said, sent me a nasty email and, and, and fell by the wayside. I think it's a testament to courage to the two guests who fronted up. They uh, may not be wise, but they are both brave. Any protesting against someone you disagree with is the lifeblood of a democracy. But this wasn't a protest. It was a mob. The only people there to listen to Posey Parker, as as I saw and uh, because I went along to it, were about 150 old school 1970s lesbians. Since when did old school 1970s lesbians deserve that level of censorship?
Well, I put, I disagree with your characterization of the entire crowd that was there. But uh, yes, we do have a lot of old school lem- uh, right. lesbian feminists. Right. Um, and I'll just remind you that these are the women who marched for homosexual law reform. Right. Who marched for our reproductive rights. Right. Who marched for same sex marriage. Right. Um, so up until this point, they would probably be, have been celebrated by those. Um, you know, threatening to stomp them. Yeah, exactly. Uh, but, you know, because they're on the wrong side, allegedly, of the debate this time, um, they they were fair game. And we saw a 70-year-old punched repeatedly yes. in the face. Yes, it was terrible bloody footage. Follow-up question. Look, I'm, I'm no fan of Parker. As far as I'm concerned, she's a toxic anger grifter who loves this reaction and attention. However, however, she is a manifestation of what happens when you censor debate as fanatically as identity politics activists do. She's a byproduct, isn't she, of using cancel culture rather than open debate. Mm. I mean, she's a friend of mine, so I disagree with uh, your characterization sure, of her. Sure, of course. But what I would agree with is that the tactics or strategy that she employs are a result of all other tactics being exhausted. For example, here in New Zealand, we had to take two councils to court to be able to have um, uh, our events where we had serious discussions about a piece of legislation yeah. um, because activists kept, um, you know, threatening and getting us cancelled from various venues. Uh, so we had to beat Palmerston North Council in court and Auckland Council then caved. Um, but, you know, if, if we are given no room for sensible, serious discussions, you, you kind of run out of runway and you've got right. to go, well, how do we have a discussion now? And yeah. And uh, Posey Parker is very good at um, getting the headline, making people talk about it. And she succeeded here. Uh, Brooke, Chris Hipkins was emphatic uh, this week that violence plays no role in political protest. Is this a moment for the political leadership of New Zealand to step up and call for calm? Oh, absolutely. You know, I think what we saw on Saturday was really disappointing now, we're supposed to be a peaceful country uh, where everybody should be able to hold a range of views. Uh, and what we're constantly seeing, and it's increasing, is a vilification of people because they hold a particular view, not a vilification of people's ideas, but of the person. And I think that's really dangerous uh, because ultimately this is going to feed down into the next generation of children who will be watching all of this play out who'll be thinking, well, I think different to my friends, I think different to my peers, but the message I'm receiving is I shouldn't say anything uh, because I might get attacked for it. Um, Or, you know what, if I'm a kid and I hear something I don't like, the adults are now sending me a message that it's okay to punch someone Mm. or it's okay to throw things at them, and that's my level of debate, and that's acceptable. And I think we have to push back against that. Otherwise, our democracy is under threat. Because if we can't have a conversation at this level, what sort of issues can we have conversations about uh, going forward? We've got some really big problems in society, and I don't want to see them, you know, become just a punching fist or a cancellation of the ideas and cancellation of people so we can't even have these ideas play out. Um, It's so dangerous for any problem solving going forward as a society. Follow-up question. Dr Gluckman was on TV this week warning political polarisation as we saw at the Saturday protest risks destabilising democracy. His quote, we've seen the weaponization of narrative, particularly through social media, and these things polarise people, make people scared, which in turn reinforces the ability for people to be more polarised. What are your thoughts? I think everybody just needs to chill out, to be honest. Um, I know that's probably not a a popular opinion at the moment, uh, especially when we're seeing um, other politicians in particular racking up the debate. And I thought what Michael Wood um, as minister said uh, in his comments about whether whether or not immigration New Zealand should allow Posey Park into the country was really immature. Uh, You know, it was a technical decision made by the Immigration Department. Uh, He had no need to say that she held vile views and he wished that she would never set foot into the country. He helped spur on this debate and an emotional reaction 
uh, when it wasn't necessary. Our leaders need to show calm, consideration, the ability to debate ideas and not chastise people. And I think we just need everybody in society to remember there are people at the end of these ideas and everybody deserves respect. Why do you, sorry, but why, why do you think both the Prime Minister and the, and the Leader of the Opposition, I mean, they both came out and said the right thing, but you got to, this wasn't kind of a Margaret Thatcher moment. I mean, they were both very muted, I thought, doing almost the minimum that they were required to. Given where I suspect most of the population are on this issue, why do you think that they were not as forthright um, as David Seymour was on this? Well, I think it's it's probably just the cancel culture going mad. You know, we have to have more politicians who are willing to have a backbone and stand up for people's democratic rights. Um, and unfortunately, when you have uh, political leaders who are not quite sure where their North Star lies, um, it becomes very easy to be swayed by the crowd. And in many cases, that's what happened at the protest too. You had a lot of people probably not necessarily sure why exactly they were turning up, uh, but they turned into a mob, they turned into a frenzy of emotion uh, because they weren't actually sure what their beliefs were and what they held to be true. Uh, and that's what I've always found great about ACT and why I originally stood for ACT is because we are champions of free speech. No matter how offensive you think someone's ideas might be, we all have a right to hold an, a, a view and a right to impart our view and for others to hear it and to come to a consensus or a disagreement on the idea. Um, that's what originally attracted me to ACT because I was so annoyed by this idea coming out of the Greens party uh, that there were bad and evil people because of their views and there wasn't enough debate. I think we need more politicians <clears throat> and leadership who are just willing to actually have a backbone. Quick round uh, on a scale of one to Alanis Morissette. How ironic was it for the trans community to claim they were unsafe and threatened when it turned out Posey Parker was the one who ended up unsafe and un and threatened? Damien? I, as I said at the start, I think it's just a, an animal farm retelling, isn't it? This is this is exactly. You go back, you go back twenty years ago, and yes, I think you you could say people who were trans, um, probably you know homosexuality was accepted, trans was was kind of on the fringes, and so I understand why there would be some residual legacy issues and insecurities. I completely get that, and I understand that, but I think that there is. There has been a failure on behalf of at least some members of that community, certainly not all, to appreciate the fact that, that they have won in a lot of ways, that they that they are the ones in charge now and that they need to show some respect um, and respect the rights of those people whose ideas are now on the margins. Uh, Annie O'Brien, one to Alanis Morissette. How ironic. Far beyond uh, Alanis Morissette, I actually have the um, opinion that a lot of that victim um, kind of narrative that happened before um, the event was actually them telling us there will be violence. Um, if you listen to what they were saying, they were saying, um, you know, if you don't stop this, there will be violence. And, um, and we heard that it was intimidation. Um, and it all played out exactly how we knew it would, which would was that the mums and lesbians who had gathered to to listen to a um, a woman who'd who'd flown from overseas uh, were attacked by the mob who who had cried on breakfast TV. Uh, Brooke, one to Alanis Morissette. How ironic! Oh, it's hugely ironic. You know, hugely, hugely ironic. Um, and it's very, very disappointing um, that we can't just have calm, rational debate. Um, I don't want to see this play out and become normalised. We have to push back against it. And and people who are constantly still in the media saying that this has been a peaceful protest do need to be called out because clearly it wasn't. We have to move on, comrades, to issue two. Five years ago, I warned the middle class woke not to start a free speech culture war because it would inadvertently trigger the dormant political fault line of ACT. 
the middle class woke activists ignored me, started their free speech culture war, and ACT went from 0.7% to 12%. Now, that represents the most explosive political polarisation New Zealand politics has ever seen. The woke can't help but hand ACT political ammunition, and they've been doing it for five years now. Will culture wars dominate election 2023? Annie, Dr. Bryce Edwards wrote a scathing critique this week of ACT and the Greens using culture war tactics what are your concerns for the election i actually think that it won't be the main maybe i'm being optimistic but i don't think it will be the main issues i think that for most new zealanders like the majority they are feeling the um, pinch of cost of living crisis and the economic issues so much that this stuff doesn't register on the same level i genuinely think that they will be thinking more at the election about who's going to make life just a little bit easier for them um, than about the culture wars issues. I think there will be a lot of sideshows um, and there will be a lot of um, sniping, but ultimately I, I do think it's the economy, stupid. Uh, Follow-up question, how relevant do you think the culture wars are to the wider electorate? I mean, people aren't sitting around the kitchen table cancelling each other for misusing pronouns, right? No, and I I tend to um, remind people that that when we play these games with language, if they go home to see their their grandparents, their their parents, their cousins, um, do, does their family speak like that? No, only a very small part of society does. Um, for most uh, people, the ideas that that we wanted to speak about on Saturday are quite normal. The idea that there's two sexes um, and that you know people can express themselves how they like, but they can't actually change sex. That's something that that most people are kind of taking as self evident. Brock, the New Zealand Herald's Fran O'Sullivan wrote on Saturday that the culture wars are set to be a defining issue in the 2023 election, and she bemoans the Posey Parker tour dominating politics in a week in which the Treasury and the Reserve Bank confirmed that New Zealand will tip into a technical recession this year. What gets missed if culture war debate dominates the election? Well, look, it, you're exactly right. There are a lot of issues going on in people's lives. Um, and most people would probably have never heard of Posey Parker and didn't actually wish to. Um, you know, they have a lot of problems going on. They're trying to figure out how to put food onto the table and why on earth it feels like every week it's getting harder to actually pay the bills um, that they've been so used to being able to pay. Uh, and now they're stretched and having to cut back on coffees and cut back on childcare. Um, you know, I think we've got two big issues here. Yes, we have an economy that's in crisis and, and the government has to cut back on its wasteful spending uh, because otherwise we're just gonna see more and more inflation. Um, that is a huge issue for most people and I think it will be the defining issue for our election. Um, I think when it comes to culture, this is not something that people necessarily want to have to talk about but they feel like they need to talk about and they're not being given the rights to express their thoughts. Um, and it's not just on one issue. You know, we've got gender politics this week, um, but it's on all issues. You know, we've had co-governance rammed down our throats by the government having an agenda uh, to have co-governance on nearly everything. Uh, but we're hearing everywhere we go around New Zealand that people don't feel like they have a right to actually talk about it. Um, they're being told what the narrative is by government, by other people who have a um, very large vocal view, uh, but they themselves don't feel like they have a right in modern New Zealand society to talk about culture. So I think in some ways it's going to be an issue that bubbles along, um, that we have to have free speech, we have to have open debate, but it's not a defining issue. Um, it's an issue that we have to allow people to talk about, um, but every day there are more concerns. Follow-up question. Posey Parker is funded by American far-right culture war conservatives. Doesn't that deserve some focus? Should American, <laughs> should American backers have influence in the New Zealand political scene? We funded okay, her. So go, 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 no, no, go, go on, Annie. Annie's got to chip in. Uh, we funded her. The woman who wanted her to come over 
Um, we but she all does. But she, yes, but she also does get funding from some pretty conservative American. No, uh, she's done. She's gone over and done events in yes. America for various places, but um, her Wikipedia page gets edited um, more than any other, I think. Um, and uh, she gets most of her funding from the women who ask her to come to the country. And and let's and let's bomber. Let's debate her ideas, right? So I don't care where she gets her her, her funding from. Um, what is interesting is are are her ideas right or are her ideas wrong? And who who writes the checks for her plane tickets is of no consequence. Damien, the woke are claiming this was a moment of, and I quote, trans joy. What do you think the rest of the electorate saw? Um, uh, I think the the rest of the electorate saw where the where the limits of free speech were, and they now know what they can say, and now they what what they can't say. It's been pretty pretty. It's laid out pretty clear what you can't say, and the consequences if you if you cross that line. Follow up question: If the left get dragged into a culture war by woke activists, can the left win it? Yes, I mean you just look at the look at the United States. I mean uh, Joe Biden, he he won. The popular vote by a considerable margin over um, what's his name, Donald Trump. The because you're looking at it from the perspective of what do the people think? Is it right or wrong? Most people aren't really that engaged, but they do understand where their bread is buttered. And so, for you stand up there and say there are two genders, and I will call you whatever pronoun you want, you will suffer a consequence as a result of that. And so we are we there is a. Um, a culture of, of intimidation and a culture of, of fear. It'd be very interesting to see the individual who poured the tomato sauce on uh, Posey Parker, whether whether they are charged or not. But even they've if they the are, they've left the country. They left the country, have they? Yep. All right. Yep. Um, but the but but that's so. Yes, I th I think that you can use the culture war as a means by which to impose your view on a public that is otherwise disinterested or unwilling to stand up. Comrades, we must move on to issue three. While all this culture war protest was exploding, Madame Davidson said on camera that as a minister, she knew who caused the violence in the world, and it was white cis males. This comment was met by a gasp and criticised immediately by every other political leader in New Zealand except the Māori Party who were like, girl, same. It's come to light that Marama had been hit by a motorbike and she was in shock when she started hating on Cracker in public. But the top 10 countries for crime are Venezuela, Papua New Guinea, South Africa, Afghanistan, Honduras, Trinidad and Tobago, Guana, El Salvador, Brazil, and Jamaica. So for Marama's claim that white cis men are the reason for violence in the world to be correct, there needs to be a huge organized teams of white cis men living as expats in Venezuela, Papua New Guinea, South Africa, Afghanistan, Honduras, Trinidad and Tobago, Guana, El Salvador, Brazil, and Jamaica, all coordinating vast crime waves to cause violence in those communities as a kind of competition league. Annie, Dr. Dr. Uh, Bryce Edwards wrote a scathing. No, no, that's no. ah. There we go. Um, <laughs> wrong question. Marama has that's since... why we've got the teleprompter. So, so, we know, got I you know. a teleprompter for this reason. Marama <laughs> has <laughs> has since walked back, hating mm. on whites as males. But the suspicion now is that that's actually what she secretly believes, isn't it? Yeah, and her Twitter account, if you you go looking out carefully enough, uh, shows that this isn't the first time she said this kind of thing before. Um, so I think that she she's probably just said the quiet part out loud, um, and now she's walking it back because she has to. Um, however, my concern about it, as much as I, I care about your two lovely feelings and how it might be a bit mean to you, I also worry that our Minister for Prevention of Family Violence um, is thinking that uh, white cis men are the only, um, you know, enactors of this violence when Māori women are disproportionately impacted by family violence in New Zealand. And because these things happen in the home, they tend to be intraracial. And so if she is trying to point out that there's only white men doing these things, she is completely neglecting the women most at risk and most vulnerable to this kind of violence. 
So she's doing no one any favours except for maybe a small group who give her a pat on the back. Follow-up question, does hating on white cis males help or hinder the Greens' election chances? Uh, um, for a small group, they all like celebrate it and, like I said, pat each other on the back. But I think the wider population is a bit sick of it, probably. Um, they'd just like to see some proper solutions to, you know, like their practical problems. Damien, three polls out last month show Greens dropping and one of them had 5.7%. Will hating on white cis males lift or sink the Greens? Is this Marama's materia moment? No, I I don't think it I don't think it is. But I'm actually quite disappointed in, in Marama Davidson. I mean, um, Brooke was talking about knowing where your North Star was. So I I think that that is Marama Davidson's North Star and she should just stick to her guns. Why is she if that's her truth, why is she backing away from it? And I think she has been bullied by James Shaw. And I think that Marama Davidson needs to stand up for what she believes in. And if she believes, that, that's why she won't come on this podcast. Because because of us, Bomber, we we are the, the, the threat. And don't remember that, that, I mean, misgendering somebody is a form of violence. And so maybe, maybe we are the ones responsible. And we just got to own that, brother. Follow-up question. How many white cis males does it take to change a light bulb? None. White cis men can't change. Uh, Brooke, Christopher Luxon is now okay, demanding. So that's why we have women to change. That isn't Christ- that the right answer? <laughs> Christopher, Brooke, Christopher Luxon is now demanding Madama apologise to all white people. Uh, this is just stupid now, isn't it? Oh, well, she should apologise to all taxpayers who are funding <laughs> yes, her yes. very sweet gig. <laughs> Quarter million dollars to do absolutely nothing. You know, she should resign as a minister, but not just for this comment, but because she's not good at her job. You know, over the past six months, she's put out around two press releases, um, and we barely hear from her in the role of prevention of family and sexual violence. Um, And when we do hear from her, it's about disparaging one race of people over everybody else. Um, And I think New Zealanders just deserve better. Follow-up question. Who is the enemy, white cis males or capitalism? (laughs) (laughs) Well, considering that, um, you know, uh, the patriarchy was responsible for a lot of capitalism, they probably go hand in hand. There you go. There you go. Comrades, comrades, we need a word from our sponsor. Damien. Well, we have a new sponsor this week. Oh, Jesus. This is, this, this is, we are very, very excited. This week's free speech special is sponsored by, wait for it, what is tomato sauce? Now, are you, are you, are you at home? Are you having trouble with people talking out of turn? Is there special people in your life saying things that are hurtful for your feelings? Are you unable to get that special person in your life to say what they, what you want them to say? Are you afraid to throw a punch? Are you concerned about jail time? Well, don't worry, because here with our special, organic, vegan, 100% all natural what is tomato sauce, you can pour this onto the head of anybody who has in any way hurt your feelings. And not only that, you will be rewarded on social media and you will face guaranteed no legal consequences as a result. Bomber, we're very excited to uh, to have this new sponsor and, and you can get to them at all good supermarkets and corner dairies. Yeah, Watties have already contacted us legally and said that they are not sponsoring this show. They've never heard of Damien Grant. They sure as fuck don't want anything to do with me. <laughs> Comrades, we must move on to issue four. So who ultimately wins and loses politically from Saturday's protest? The woke think they chased off a transphobe who endangers their community. The rest of the country saw a lone woman get assaulted and driven out. The issue is, should biological women have a right to philosophically and intellectually challenge entry into their spaces by biological men who present as women? Damien, winners and losers, please. Uh, I think, um, at least in the short term, I think that the trans community have won, and I think that there is um, a chilling effect on the debate. I think the enthusiasm of people to challenge things like the gender ideology, uh, puberty blockers, gender reassignment, we haven't seen big issues of gender reassignment in New Zealand. It's a big issue overseas. Mm. Um, it, seemed to, it seemed to have peaked overseas. Issues like Travis Stock and so forth, it seems to, seems to be sort of coming unstuck. 
But I think that that is an issue that we're going to have to grapple with. But I, um, I think that we have not seen in New Zealand the degree of political pushback that there has been happening in other jurisdictions. So I think at least in the short term, um, and, and that between now and the election, I think that the, the trans community has won. And I don't know that there's necessarily that many votes. Um, if you like Mr Hepkins, this is probably not going to cost him um, a vote. It may damage the Greens, though. Annie, I have many self-declaring feminist friends, women, who privately tell me they have real misgivings with some of the trans woke dogma, but are terrified of saying anything because the fourth wave feminists, non-binary activists, and trans ally vegan mummy bloggers will rip them to pieces on social media. Who wins and who loses from this debate? I think um, you've you've kind of summed it up nicely um it is there's too much of a cost for uh women and those who agree with us um to speak out when you see you know and i was in the crowd just meters away from her i thought they were going to kill her Mm. um it was terrifying um and so i think that i don't think the trans community has won um i think that those activists though that particular group who who have driven this they've won um, they've got their spots in the media and, and all that. But for your ordinary trans person who wants to live a good life and and get on with things, I don't think they've won. I think life becomes more difficult for them mm. because I think that they uh, face the very real possibility of, of backlash from parts of um, uh, the community. We saw um, some uglier scenes down in um, Aotea Centre um, where uh, Destiny's Church was getting involved. Um, I don't want to see that. <laughs> that's that's not what I want to see at all. Um, so I worry that neither trans nor women won, but those self-important, self-elected uh, community leaders uh, won. Uh, Brooke, we want our trans Fano to have the same agency as every other citizen in society, and we want them to be able to live a life as good as anyone else. But I think the issue is it not comes back to this 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 point that biological women should have a say over who's in these spaces. And I don't think we've actually gotten to that part of the debate and we haven't been allowed to have that part of the debate. Who are the winners and losers here? Well, I, I don't think anybody has, has been the winners and losers. Like you say, we haven't been able to hear rational debate on either side. Uh, what we've seen is a lot of emotion. Uh, but we haven't actually had analysis of good ideas. Um, I don't think anybody wins in a fight where physical violence uh, ends debate or becomes what you resort to. But I think I know what needs to win, and that is open debate, um, analysis of, of ideas, and democracy and the rules that we have that underpin our society. That's what needs to win. Um, and, and it just goes back to show why it's so important uh, that we fought hard against the hate speech laws. Because mm, if you can yeah, imagine yeah. You know, we having a, a law in society now that says you'd be criminalized or prosecuted for holding an offensive or insulting opinion, um, people on one side would be very quick to get their pitchforks out and say that the other side are bad and evil and need to be criminalized. And we have to be better than that uh, because we're going down a very ugly path um, and we have to stop it before it, before it continues. So we have to have open dialogue. So just talk us through, there was the original draft of the hate speech speech laws and there was a watered down version that, that um, is turned up. So what was the difference between the two and how would that have impacted on this debate? So uh, the government originally drafted a piece of law that said um, it would be criminal to have a threatening or offensive or insulting speech. Um, That that went way too far because it's extremely subjective. They Mm. then peered it back and said um, it would only be about religion. Um, So if you had insulting um, speech against a particular religion, which I also think um, is essentially a blasphemy law, which goes to my opinion. Um, And then they've kicked it to touch and said, well, now we'll get the law commission to look at it 
um, after the election. I think that's just sneaky um, and shows that if Labour did get back in and had this mob rule and mentality coming through from very upset people, um, that they would once again try and reinstate the law after the election. So what, but, you what, know, what's all got you here? Um, um, our mutual friend, um, New Zealand First, Winston Peters, he's been coming out with some stuff about changing the Waka Kotani back to the Minister of Transport and so forth. Does that does that look like he's coming after your votes? Well, Winston's not coming after anything. As far as I'm aware. <laughs> Um, do you, but do you, do you, you, you do raise a good point there about you know the the culture war and I think what he's just been picking up on is is the same feeling that I'm getting from a lot of people in society that um, there's been a lot of um, te reo Māori being used to the point where most people can't understand how to access basic bureaucracy and government departments. Um, and it's because there's a bunch of people down in Wellington who have decided um, that Māori names need to be for all government departments. The, di the difference that I have with, with New Zealand First on this is I don't agree with just stripping back all Māori government departments. You know, I think we do actually have a, a beautiful language in the Māori language, um, and we have it as one of our official languages. But what I would say is that we should put the English language first, the one that the vast majority of people understand, hmm. and then the translation. Because when you have people uh, unable to access transport departments or the healthcare system because they don't know what the Māori words for basic uh, English language is, um, then we have a real problem. Comrades, we need to wrap now with a fine <laughs> word. Damien Grant, your rant for 90 seconds. Please go to the mountaintop, comrade. Well, before um, I do that, we'd just like to thank our two uh, guests. Um, if you like what Annie has had to say uh, today, and you should, you can find Annie O'Brien on Twitter at, at A-N-I-O-B-R-I-E-N, Annie O'Brien. Uh, and if you like what Brooke Van Velden has had to say, you can catch her on Twitter at, at Brooke, B-R-O-O-K-E-V-A-N-V-E-L-D-E-N. And my final words today, I want to talk about courage. Because despite what um, Chanel Lal was saying, that he felt terribly threatened, it was really clear right from the get-go that they were out to make trouble and that violence was a real possibility. I don't think that uh, Posey Parker and Annie O'Brien and, and the rest of the people who went down there expected to get what they got. But nonetheless, despite that uncertainty, uh, they went down there and they confronted uh, the people who were causing them trouble and they, they walked into the lion's den. Uh, and I think that those people who did not shrink from that responsibility, the security firm that continued to honour their commitment, there was a security firm in Wellington who did not honour their commitment, possibly because they had government contracts and they were cowards. Uh, I understand that there was a number of um, um, other service providers who refused to su uh, supply services to, to Posey Parker. Uh, and so for those individuals, including Annie O'Brien, who were down there on Albert Park on that day, they demonstrated courage. Uh, and ultimately, I think, whilst in the short term, I think that, that the trans activists, and I like the way that um, Annie drew a distinction between the majority of the trans community and the small number of activists. While those activists have had a, a, a win, I think that the courage and the grace um, of those people who were the victims of abuse and violence on Saturday, they will prevail and they will prevail because they have courage and they are prepared to stand up, not just to the thugs who turned up on Saturday, but to all of the other forms of social and commercial pressure that are applied on them. And so, Annie O'Brien, I take my hat off to you. Well done. Annie, your final word this week, please. Um, I just want to extend that to all the women who came along, who came and spoke to me. Uh, we had a short time uh, before the, the kind of chaos descended where um, we were able to talk to each other and support each other because it was a very intimidating environment. Um, and so I want to say um, to all of those women, thank you for being 
um, so brave and coming out and um, we have to continue to be brave and um, make sure that we're heard and um, I just want to send a very different message to the New Zealand media uh, because I believe that they are at least in part responsible for what happened on Saturday. Uh, the lies that they told about a woman who has no connection to Nazis and apart from a dodgy Wikipedia page and being gate crashed in Melbourne has never had any connection to them. She's disavowed them. Our media continued to push that narrative. They, they blurred out her hand as she zipped up her top because they considered that she was making a white supremacist uh, hand gesture. Um, and in doing so, they justified the violence that happened because no one likes a Nazi, no one. And so if you justify um, that this person is a Nazi, most people think, well, maybe they do deserve what they get. Um, and that was exactly what the activists wanted to happen. They can't tar us with the brush of turf because most people are turfs, if they know what it, what it means. Um, and so they, they seek to call us Nazis instead. Um, and so to the New Zealand media, I say shame on you. Shame on you for, for celebrating the violence that we saw on Saturday, for interviewing the people who assaulted women. Uh, and for for neglecting, I don't know, any semblance of balance and um, and and moral fortitude. Um, and I obviously feel very strongly about this, so I'm going to leave it there. <laughs> Thank you, Annie. Brock, your final word, please, this week. Oh, my my final word is that all of life is problem solving, like the wonderful philosopher Karl Popper said. You know, we have a lot of problems that we will encounter as a society um, and as individuals um, and throughout our lives and the generations that follow, uh, we, people will seek ways to solve these problems. And we have to use reason, logic and debate to analyze ideas to see what will be the best solution to the problems that we face. And that requires us to be able to talk about ideas to hold different ideas and to be able to debate ideas to come to consensus um, i think it's a real problem that if we have um, people resorting to violence because they don't like an idea um, on such a small issue uh, like gender identity uh, compared to some other huge issues we face about how you structure the entire economy um, you know, we are going to really do our entire country a disservice. I don't want to see us become a country where anyone who puts forward a different way of solving the challenges of our country uh, will become chastised or vilified or uh, in some ways celebrated, you know, if they're punched or threatened. You know, we have to be better than that so we can actually solve some of those massive issues like how do we get good education for kids how do we solve huge crim criminal recidivism rates um, and how do we make sure that people have high wages in our economy you know we can't become a society that becomes fearful of putting ideas out there otherwise we'll just become sort of some backwater nation thank you comrades to my final word this week when I led protests back when I was at university, I took on enemies who could fight back. I took on Auckland University. I took on the education ministry. I took on the police, lots. I took on the government, many times. I also took on the mass surveillance state, once was enough. I also carried the scars of those battles with real power because that's what happens when you take on real power. It fights back. So I'm not going to be lectured to by the current crop of snowflake woke protesters who are all screaming the weekend's thugs veto assault of Posey Parker and the chasing of her from the public square was some kind of fucking victory because it was not. All those being triumphant over assaulting Posey Parker and telling the rest of New Zealand is that you are prepared to use violence and intimidation any time you disagree. The woke have no comprehension how this thug's veto is playing outside their echo bunkers to the wider electorate. Mob 
rule isn't protest. Because woke activists now rely on echo chambers and cancel culture, they have lost the ability to persuade. Posey Parker is what happens when we censor and the mob attack on her weakens the left's moral high ground. The left should be championing free speech, not limiting it. And when we do protest, it should be to win over people, not beat them up. In the end, it wasn't the trans community who were in danger. It was Posey Parker. And that's exactly what that anger grifter wanted. Comrades, your enemy isn't a woman who says stupid shit about trans people in a public park. Your enemy are the banks, oil companies, billionaires, and property speculators hey. who continue to pillage this country while we are bickering over the narcissism of petty difference. Now here's Tom with the weather. Well, we'll see you next week for The Working Group, New Zealand's best weekly political podcast that isn't funded by New Zealand On Air. Kia ora and ka pai. Stay classy, Adira. That was New Zealand's greatest weekly political podcast, The Working Group. Not one minute of this show was funded by New Zealand On Air. Nope, no creamy public broadcasting money for us. That was The Working Group.